All right. Yep. Looks like we're going live. Hey, IWC tribe and uh, others out there. Listen, I'm at my home today uh, doing this presentation. So if somebody knocks at the door, if the dog comes up barking, if one of my kids walk in, I apologize. But I really wanted to reach out to you today. I know that there's a lot of people out there right now that are at high levels of stress. And what we're hoping to do today with this webinar is to give you some tools and some resources that can help you not just get through this time, but actually to thrive through this time. And uh, so let's jump in. Let me go and start sharing my screen here with you. All right. Um, share screen, desktop. There we go. All right. If you guys can see this, please give me a thumbs up here. Let's see. Can you guys see us? There's nothing else on here. All right, looks good. All right, so I'm Dr. Josh Shields. I'm the owner and founder of uh, Integrative Wellness Centers where we've been helping patients now in Michigan for the last eight years. And I'm proud to say that we have become one of the largest functional medicine clinics in the country. Um, and I believe it's because what we do is we help people understand what the truth is and we care for people the way that we'd want to be cared for. And I think a lot of our patients can speak for that. So if you guys are patients and you're watching this, just let people know and let them hear um, from you right now by making a comment and say, hey, you know what, this is something that has been very good and, and is a great care because a lot of people aren't familiar with what good care looks like. But realistically, what we want to do with our patients is we want to help them find natural solutions for their health issues. Unfortunately, too many people are struggling and it's just because they're not being told what it is that they can be doing. And especially with depression and anxiety, uh, these conditions, uh, they can be treated with medications, but many cases what we're finding is, is that simply not addressing what people need to, need to be doing. And yes, that can be helpful and it can be beneficial, but we've got to really start looking at all the different things that can affect someone's well-being. And it's usually a multitude of factors that play in to affect how somebody's functioning or how somebody's feeling. And we have to take all those things to heart. And I can tell you from my own personal story, and I think this is probably a good place to explain it, is um, one of the things that led me here to being on this presentation today is my own suffering. And at one point in time in my career, uh, well, let me back up even a little bit. As a child, um, I never had a lot of anxiety or depression. Um, of course, you know, just the typical waves of when you didn't feel good about some of the social situations you were put in as a kid and you questioned, you know, if you were liked and if you were a part of the group. And, and so there were definitely some things in, the, in my childhood, but, you know, even in my early twenties, I never noticed any anxiety or any depression. And then finally I graduated college and I remember the first week when I finally got out of school and, and started seeing patients. I remember that first week I didn't sleep. It was just terrifying to be responsible for people's health. And I remember laying awake, not being able to sleep. And, and that was the first sign of it. But as I got into my routine and started getting used to what I was doing, I started to sleep. I started to feel better. But then a few years went by and I noticed that I started having a, a, a bit more of my own sleep issues. And I don't know if you guys are familiar, but if you've ever seen a child that doesn't sleep, they're irritable, they're crabby, they're cranky, they're emotional. And that's what happened to me. As I started losing my sleep, I started becoming more and more anxious. I became, then of course, as more and more anxiety, I started getting more and more depressed. And, you know, it's a little embarrassing for me to tell you this, but I remember a time in my life when I was sitting in my car outside of my office and I'm, I'm, I'm weeping, I'm crying. And I was terrified to go to work. I, I just didn't know if I could do it anymore. And at, at one point in my life, I ever contemplated quitting care. I mean, quitting my career and maybe doing something different that didn't involve with so much responsibility of being a business owner and also being a doctor and caring for people. And, you know, it was a tough time in my life. And thankfully, someone introduced me to functional medicine. And after I met with that doctor, everything for, my, for me in my life started to change. But you know, I have to be honest, I wish it was just the functional medicine. I was just, I wish it was just me changing my diet and taking some supplements and understanding what my root cause of my health issues were. But really that was just the start of my journey because what we find is that when you're, when you have a weakness, when you have some, some point in your life where you start to break, 
Like if, if imagine if you have a chain on your bike and this chain always breaks in one spot, it's not going to break in new spots. It's going to always break where it's weakened. And ultimately, because I was prone to depression and anxiety because of some of my family history, that's where my body, that's where the stress affects me. And some of you, you know, your stress might affect your digestion. Some of you might be affect your hormones. Some of you, it might be that it affects your, your mood. Uh, and for me, it was, I just always get, I just got more anxious and more depressed and, and I couldn't sleep. And so over the years, I've had to learn that I've had to add other things to my toolkit in order to really bring my life to its fullest potential, to optimize my health to its to everything it needs to be, because it's not just one layer or one thing that we're going to talk about today that's going to make a difference in your life. It's going to be a lot of little things that come together that hopefully can help you conquer stress and overcome it. So let's get started. The first thing is it's understandable that we have to, like I've just been saying, is that we in our lives were born up here at health and hopefully we're born where we're happy. We're usually not very stressed. We're not very overwhelmed, but then obviously we can have emotional traumas. We can be brought up in an environment that is, is abusive. Uh, we can have relationships that hurt us and harm us, but, and we know that those things are going to take us and, and cause us where our bodies are going to start to be going down. And hopefully with some stress though, after, after we remove the stress, we can go back up and we can actually become stronger because that's what stress can do. Like, for example, with the stress of working out, it, it puts stress on the muscles, but then we get stronger. And typically that what we see with see that with, with even mental stress is that some mental stresses are actually good because it teaches you to learn and to adapt and to change and also to be empathetic and to be understanding. And so some emotional stressors are good, but what happens is when we leave those emotional stressors long term, it starts to really wear on our body. As it starts to wear on our body, we become depleted. When we become depleted, we can start having some of these symptoms, you know, fatigue, achiness. We can have mood swings. We can have troubles with our sleep, memory issues. And that's what happens with the long-term chronic stress. Over time, it can actually lead to where our brains become broken. And this is where we see some people that are, are diagnosed with, let's say, bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Um, we also know that some mental disorders can also lead to Alzheimer's or dementia, where they become more serious diseases or actually damage to our organs. And so we always want to avoid this area because this isn't a fun place to be. Um, but it's not just going to be the emotional stresses that wear us down. It's also going to be the physical things. And we're going to talk a lot about more of that, about that today. But we know that, for example, you know, the more inactive somebody is, the more sedentary somebody is, the more depressed they can become. We've seen it where in psychiatric hospitals where they found that they had their, their patients working out and exercising daily, that that was almost one of the most effective things they could do to improve mood and anxiety. We also know that there's certain environmental triggers in our environment now that can cause and trigger stress. Obviously, we need sunlight. Uh, it's been shown that vitamin D is very important for our moods. And so sunlight helps with the vitamin D, helps with our mood and our energy. And then there's going to be some biological stresses that we're going to discuss at the end of the seminar today, too, that is going to discuss, you know, some of the hidden stresses that are inside of our bodies that we're unaware of that could be contributing to some of our stress and anxiety. But please understand that there's not a one size helps everybody program or even a solution for anybody. It has to be put in all these pieces and layers together. And ultimately, we're going to have to take some responsibility for how we feel and understand that ultimately the typically the only way that we can really get out of a hole is if we climb out of it ourselves, if we work towards it ourselves and really start applying and doing as much as we can, because as soon as we don't believe that we're responsible for how we feel or that we can't control how we feel, and then we're stuck in the hole, there's no way out. And so we're gonna talk about that a little bit later about having a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And please understand, I'm, I'm not trying to be discompassionate to people out there that are truly put in a bad situation and have had a lot to overcome or maybe have some genetic predispositions. But ultimately, even with those things, you still have to believe that you can do it, that you can get better. So let's move forward. With those stresses, like we talked about, we know that there's physical pot. We know that people that are in chronic pain can have emotional stress. We know that, for example, uh, one of the studies I, I read is that that people with low back pain typically also have a higher displeasure for their work environment. So the more you dislike your work, the more likely to have back pain. We know that our weight can also put some stress on our bodies. 
we know that there's some environmental issues like we talked about earlier, emotional issues, biological issues. And what I want you to think about is as you go through this list and you check, well, I've got that, I've got that, I've got that, I've got that. I want you to think of a scale. So as you put things on the scale over time, that scale is going to get too far and too over and it's going to set it and click it over to now where you have those symptoms, where you get out of that adaptation phase that we showed you earlier, when you get into that disease stage or that broken stage, when you start to have those symptoms. So it's really about finding out from all these things, you know, what things do I need to do or what things can I improve that are going to take some of that weight off the scale so I can feel better and function better. Because ultimately what we see is that physical stress or stressors, physical, emotional, environmental, biological are going to trigger a fight or flight response. And Dr. Paris just talked about this the other day on one of our webinars, but you know, it's, it's basically like we're, our bodies have a stress response and it's supposed to be for our benefit. For example, if, if a bear or something jumps out of the woods, you need to have a stress response. You need to be able to fight the bear or run from the bear. So your body's gonna prepare by releasing a hormone called cortisol. That cortisol is, is going to actually liberate sugars from your fat and from to get it so that your body can have more sugars for the muscles. So it can fly, fight or, fl or flee. Um, it's also, though, the problem, though, is if we are continually being exposed to stressors, which are more and more common these days, it seems, that we're going to start having that cortisol and long term cortisol effects is going to start to cause neurological damage. It's going to actually shunt and stop our digestive function. And we've actually, I've seen some slides where it shows people that are stressed and actually shows the, the cells, the parietal cells in the gut, and it shows them becoming damaged with the long-term stress. Um, we're gonna see inflammation, tissue inflammation long-term with exposure to stress. We're gonna to start to see where when you affect one hormone, you start to affect all the other hormones. One of the common, most common causes of progesterone deficiency that we see in our patients is long-term chronic stress. And so, we'll see a patient where their, their progesterone levels are lower than they should be. And it's actually because it's called a progesterone still with a cortisol actually to make cortisol. It takes on the building blocks that would make progesterone. So now you're making cortisol instead of progesterone. So now your progesterone levels start to drop and then you get estrogen dominant type of symptoms where you're gonna have the heavy menses, the painful menses, you're gonna have the clots, you're gonna, you're gonna have the PMS, the irritability, the more that, those, those hormones aren't balanced, the less progesterone you have. And then we know that when cortisol is released, it can then release more blood sugars into your body. And that can then lead to more issues with handling blood sugars over time. And so one of the things that we see is a lot of times when we're under stress, we like to eat because it's going to actually make the body go into the parasympathetic nervous system. It's going to calm things down. It's going to slow things down because that your body then has to stop the fight or flight. And it goes into the feed and breed system, which is the parasympathetic, the more relaxed system. And so that's why some people find when they're stressed, they like to eat where others like myself, when I'm stressed, I can't eat. I, I just don't feel like putting anything in because I'm fight or flight. I'm living on those hormones. And so that's just the different ways, but I have found that when I am stressed and I'm overwhelmed that actually I want to be more catabolic, which means I want to be more growth oriented. I'm sorry, more anabolic. A, a lot of times catabolic means the body's breaking down. And that's my tendency when I'm stressed is I break my, my body starts to break down. And so what to combat that breaking down, I found that if I do weightlifting versus cardiovascular training, so I want to go in, and actually I want to try to gain weight. I want to try to bulk up. I want to try to build mass. I also found that taking products like creatine has also been effective and it's actually been researched. It can lower your, um, your stress response, but it also can uh, lower the cortisol levels, but it can also help you build muscle mass. And so I find that if I start trying to gain some weight and I eat more often, I feel better more often. And also another converse I've seen too, where people, if they're not eating, their blood sugars start to drop. When the blood sugars get too low, your body will have a stress response to get the sugars back up. And so this is why some people will wake up in the middle of the night, uh, they say two or three o'clock at night, and they, they're like wide awake. And it's because of that cortisol flush because their blood sugars got too low. And we start to see that in patients that especially have blood sugar regulation issues, patients that are starting to become insulin resistant where their body has too much insulin and insulin helps pull the sugars down. But what happens is let's say they didn't eat enough before dinner or their insulin levels are too high and their sugars come crashing down, then they wake up in the middle of the night. And so sometimes that can be a blood sugar regulation issue. And I have found that when I'm taking the creatine and I'm, and I'm, and I'm eating more proteins, 
that it helps stabilize my blood sugars through the night. So even when I'm going through a lot of emotional stress, I won't have that same response I used to uh, several years ago. I hope that helps. So how can we overcome the causes and enhance our resiliency, ease, and happiness when we are stressed? How can we overcome these things? So the next few slides, we're going to talk about some of the emotional things that we can do to overcome these issues. The first is the five, the five fundamentals is in, we want to increase your mental strength. Your brain is neuroplastic. That means it grows, it can expand, it can change, it can grow. And unfortunately, it can also get into patterns. And sometimes these patterns can be unhealthy. And sometimes we don't realize it, but a lot of times we don't realize is that we can actually increase our mental strength, that there are certain things that we can do to improve our brain function and make it more resilient to stress. And that's one of the things that I've seen in my life now is that the stressors that I used to go through, especially now, I mean, there's no way I should be sleeping a wink anymore, but I've been sleeping relatively pretty good through all this. And it's because I have really worked hard to understand that I, I have to improve my mental strength. And I'll go over some of those exercises with you later. You have to exercise regularly. It's one of the fundamentals. You have to eat well, and you've got to sleep better, and you've got to sleep longer. And then you have to eliminate those hidden stressors, which we're going to go over at the very end. Now, it's, under, it's important to understand, once again, is this just reiterates, reiterates what we've been talking about. It's not going to be one thing, guys. And that's the biggest mistake so many people make. You know, we've seen thousands of people, and I've lectured to thousands of patients that have been depressed, that have been anxious. And we get caught up in the idea that there's going to be a, a pill that's going to rescue us and pull us from how we're feeling. And yes, sometimes we can recommend an herbal supplement that can help benefit like ashwagandha or kava kava. And my favorite is theanine. We can take these supplements and they can help, but we still have to address the other things that we're responsible for. If I just take the theanine, but I continue to, to not exercise, I continue not to, to, to have the proper diet and I continue not to have the right microbiome in my gut. And I continue to to have repetitive negative thought patterns, automatic thought patterns, then you're going to continue to go down. It's still gonna not enough to bring you back up. So you have to figure out how all these pieces come into play and you have to apply each one of these. So I told you I'd go to this later, but there's gonna be two types of mindsets. And this is what we've seen is that, and this is what Angela Duckworth, the talks that Duckworth talks about in her book, Brit, is that in her studies is that the fixed mindset says, I don't think I can get better. This is just who I am and something's just wrong with me. It's just the way I'm built and there's nothing I can do about it. And, and a lot of times I always so find with these fixed mindset patients is that they're also the ones that are looking though for the magical pill, that they're hoping that they can get the magical supplement, the magical prescription that's going to pull them from how they feel. And a lot of times they're not doing as much as they can be doing because they are in a sense, a passive participant in how they feel. The other type of mindset patient is somebody that is going to be growth mindset. This is somebody that says, I think I can. I know I can get better. I have these challenges. I'm feeling this way, but I know I can overcome them. And I am malleable that I am able to change. And you have to be more growth mindset. So really think about that for a second and take a second to reflect on your life and say, do you believe that you're in control of your, of, of how you feel? Do you believe you're in control of your circumstances, your environment? Do you have the ability to make things better or is life the way it is? And sometimes we have mindsets, typically we're developed, we've grown from our mothers, our fathers, our teachers, our preachers, our TVs, and now our social media is that we have developed a pattern. And, and a lot of times it can be fixed or it can be growth mindset. So, so those are some things to be aware of. Remember, you are your thoughts. And this is a big one for me because I got to, and, and I don't want to say this out loud, but deep down inherently, I'm a skeptic. I'm skeptical of myself. I'm skeptical of others. I'm doubtful. I'm not very trustworthy. And for me, that's hard because that pattern is, is, is who I am. And please understand that you are like a computer. To this point, your computer has been programmed by everything around you. Your environment has trained you and taught your brain to have a certain response. And what you 
what's been coming into your life and coming into your, your subconscious is actually what makes you drive your decisions. They actually did some research now that they actually, actually can hook you up to a computer and they can ask you a question. And before you even answer the question, the computer will determine what your answer will be because it can pull a part of your brain. It can see the decisions being made before in your unconscious before it actually comes to your consciousness. So a lot of times we think that we're making decisions and it's our rational decisions, but really there's, there's some underlining programming there that has already decided how you're gonna decide but how the decisions are gonna be made. So it's so important to understand about and controlling and making sure we watch the input that's going in. And we have to retrain our thoughts um, and almost on a daily basis, you know, and I, you know, I don't wanna to get too far ahead of myself. I think we're gonna go into this some more as we get into this, but it's so important to start measuring and start looking at the thoughts that you're having. Are they mostly positive? Are they mostly negative? And I, I like to think about it as, um, if you've got a, a good little guy on your shoulder, that remember the little Tom and Jerry where you have the little devil on one shoulder? I think it's the Tom and Jerry cartoons where you have the little devil on one shoulder and you got the little angel on the other shoulder and they're both speaking to you. And ultimately it turns out is it's the one that you listen to the most is the one you're gonna become most like. And I always kind of pride myself. I like listening to that little devil, that little skeptic, the little guy over there that was always naysaying everybody else as well as naysaying myself. And that's who I became over the time is I became a more negative, um, skeptical, fearful person of other people. And I got to tell you, to this day, I still struggle with that. But now at least I can understand. It's kind of like a little joke. When I start to hear that little negative guy, I'm like, oh, stop. And I think of the cartoon. I think of the little guy on my shoulder. I think, okay, what would you like to say? And then I listen to him because the more often I listen to him, the more my thoughts have started to change to more positive thoughts. I hope that helps. You are who you think you are. You know, we have a belief about who we are. And I have to be honest with you. And, and, I, and I, looking back at my life, I can tell you that, you know, it started for me at a young age. I, I remember, you know, never feeling like I was good enough, like I could really fit in with other people, that I was really a part of the group. I always felt a little excluded. And a part of that exclusion had led me to believe that I wasn't good, that I was bad, that I was inherently different, and that I was broken. And I, I still remember this day, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get emotional, but I still remember this day when I finally got that affirmation. It wasn't from my family members. It wasn't from my mom, my family. It wasn't from my dad, but it was from, a, a, it was from somebody I'd been working with. And, and he stopped one day, and he, he, saw, he looked at me and said, you know, Josh, I just want you to know that you're a wonderful father. You're a great doctor. You're a great friend. And because you've been in my life, you've made my life better. And I got to tell you, I wept. <sighs> because it was contrary to what I had believed in myself. And right now you've bought a story. You bought a belief about who you are. And I just hope that one day you get lucky enough to understand that you aren't really who you think you are. You inherently probably, not saying everybody, but you're probably a really good person. You are trying your best. You're doing everything you can do. And ultimately, you are loved and you are cared for. And people, and ultimately, you're just trying to get through this life and do the best that you possibly can do. So I hope that helps. But just really understand that is that you are who you think you are. So it's gonna be real important as we talk about this a little bit later about the visualizations, the affirmations, the, you know, really seeing yourself and, and taking the 10,000 foot view above and really looking at your life and, and taking a, an analysis of it, understanding, you know, of what's really happening because we can get caught up in the minutia. So stop trying to change things. Another uh, key is the serenity key. I think a lot of you have heard about the serenity prayer. But it's, you know, stop trying to change things outside of yourself, especially with the COVID-19 going on and all the stresses that are outside of us. There's a lot of things that we can't control. And I can tell you is that we need to focus on changing the things that you can control and accept the things that you cannot. And I really like the second part of this is accept the things you cannot. Is, and, and that's something that I believe is, is inherently hard for a lot of people. But because earlier we just mentioned, well, we believe that we're in control of our, of our environment, that we're in control of, of what's happening to us in our lives. On some level, we are, but it's not really 
what we're controlling, what's going to happen to us. And that's what we can't control. We can't control other people. We can't control what happens to us. We can only control how we respond to things and about how we, and our perceptions about how things are. And ultimately, just like this COVID-19, you know, we had no control in this. And a part of, I believe my success with overcoming some of these emotional stressors has been being allowed to understand is that we can't control it. And I, I still remember one of my friends is a Zen Buddhist in Atlanta and he actually is a psychiatrist and he, and he, and he actually teaches at the church. You know, he, he taught me, he says, you know, Josh, I want you to think of, uh, of, of a surfer. And one of the things that surfers learn is that when they're riding these huge waves and they get tossed into the water and into the ocean, that the last thing they want to do is fight because if they start fighting and scrambling, trying to get to the surface, that they're going to run out of oxygen and they're going to, it's going to make it worse. And what they're actually taught is when they enter the waves, when they, when they get crashed into a wave is that they want to relax and let the wave take them where it's going to go. And it's the same thing in my life now. And I've really tried to adopt that idea of is that when everything's coming, crashing down on you, there's a part of serenity to saying, you know what? I'm not in control of everything that's going on around me. My job is to relax in all of this chaos and let it do what it's going to do. And I, and that has been a huge eye opener for me. And it really does take a lot of the pressure off of just saying, you know what, I'm not in control of everything that's going to happen to me. I can, can just control how I respond to it. I can take an analysis, analysis of the environment and I can look for an opportunity to get out of it and to change it and to make the best of it. And that's one of the things we have to start doing. Anxiety is not being present. You know, they say that anxiety is the fear of the future or the regrets of the past. The fear of the future or the regrets of your past. And I want you to look at this picture and I want you to think about it. Now imagine up here way in front of this person, is, is, that, a, is that a man that's hiding behind the tree? Does he have a knife? Is he up there? Is he going to hurt me? And see, they say that fear is false evidence appearing real. And the truth is, is that you're not a mind reader. We don't know how this is going to end. We don't know what's going to happen at the end of all this. But I can assure you that the person that goes through this with the relaxed mental attitude of saying that they just have to take it one day, one time at a, and one moment at a time, that it's so helpful. And then also not looking at the past and have those regrets. But the big important thing here to understand from this picture is that you don't have to worry about what's in front of you if you just worry about where you're at right now. So one of the things I like to do is I like to take an analysis is when, when, when I am under a lot of stress, I like to take a deep breath and I like to look around and say, okay. And I like to look at my hand. I like to look at my fingerprints. I like to look at my limbs. I like to look at my surroundings. I really like to understand where I'm at. And I say, you know what? There's no fire. There's nothing really right now that is endangering me because that's that fight or flight response. Remember, that's that bear that's attacking you. It's that emotional fight or trauma that you just got into. But it's just important to say, you know what? Everything is okay. It's, it, it is okay because right now everything is okay. Okay, hope that helps. Stop seeing the obstacles in your life as threats. Instead, view them as challenges that you can lean into, learn from, and overcome. You know, I think a lot of times we like to look at things like, like they're stressful. We like to, to view them as, as, a, an, uh, as a threat. And it's really just an obstacle. And we just have to look to see, you know, from this obstacle, from this challenge that I'm experiencing right now in my life, what do I need to do? What can I learn from this? And what can I do to help overcome it so that I can grow from it? Instead of seeing it as an obstacle or as a threat, because threats, all they're going to do, threats just hurt you. They just bring you down. They bring you down. They hurt you, hurt you, hurt you. So just rephrase some of the things that you've said yourself and look at it as an opportunity. And I tell you, um, I've seen a lot of this with, with the COVID-19 and, and what people are doing right now is, is, is some businesses are looking to, to pivot and to transition and to find a way to make the best of it. Thank God for Uncle Sam coming in and giving a lot of these small business owners a lot of reprieve and a lot of help, which I don't think it was unprecedented. So it's been very helpful to have that. But even from that, you just have to say, okay, you know, I just have to learn from this, what's happened and what can I do in the future to make sure if this ever happens again, what can I do to overcome it? And what can I do right now to get stronger through it? So one of the ways that, that we're trying to help and, and, and right now is with a little bit more time is we're trying to educate and help more often and, and give more to our, to our community to help you guys. 
how can I get better from this challenge or from your pain? Uh, you know, and one of the, the keys here is to change your stories that we all have a story. And Oprah Winfrey has been one of the most influential people, I think, for a lot of people in this world, uh, especially in the last 20 years is from her TV show, because she was always so, you know, so inspirational, but it's her story that's so amazing is here's a woman that was beaten, molested, abused, a lot of reasons, growing up in the worst neighborhoods, I think in Mississippi, where there's a, a lot of excuses that, that she should have never become who she did. And instead of using those traumas and those experiences, her past, to define her as having a bad life, and, and, and she's decided to take that and use that as a fuel to help others and, and to hopefully help them also change their stories. And I think that's really what she's always been about. It's about that personal empowerment of, hey guys, if I've been through this, you can get through this too. And so, so many times we have a story and those stories that we tell ourselves can, can, can put us in that little box that we're stuck in. And we don't wanna be stuck in that box. We wanna find a way to get out of that box. So we have to understand is that anything that's happened to us in the past is the past. And now we have to figure out what we can do to overcome it and get stronger from it and better from it. The number one way to prove your presence, like I mentioned earlier, to reduce anxiety and create an inner calm is to take that deep breath and to breathe slowly. There's a lot of neuroscience that's involved with this. Your brain's connected to the vagus nerve that actually helps your diaphragm go up and down. As you move the diaphragm up and down and you control that, it actually helps increase your parasympathetic nervous system. It actually has been shown to help shunt the pair and, and turn off the sympathetic and turn on the parasympathetic. And that's going to put you more back into that feed, breathe, and uh, feed, breed, and breathe part of your nervous system that really allows you to get that calm. So take that moment to breathe. And one of the things I love to do when I'm, I'm going through the breathing exercises is to practice gratitude, which we're going to cover more in a minute. So I always get ahead of myself. I'm sorry. All right, let's see. Are you guys enjoying this so far? Let me know. Hopefully somebody, let's see. If you're enjoying this, let me know. Give me a thumbs up. Make a comment. Let me know. All right, that you guys are still here. We want to reduce self-absorption, uh, replace with love and service. I can tell you that whenever I get depressed or anxious, because I'm in so much pain, the pain then turns into self-focus. And I found one way to get rid of the pain is to stop worrying about how I feel and start thinking about how I can affect and help love and serve others. When I start thinking about how I can love and give to others and make them feel better, it takes the focus away from myself. So that's been a tool that I've been using. Another tool is social, another thing to be care, careful of is social comparison. Um, you know, right now, especially with social media, um, but I think everybody's done it. You've seen those neighbors where you're like, man, they've got the best relationship ever. I wish mine could be more like that. Every time we do that, it just makes us feel inadequate. It makes us feel depressed. It makes us feel anxious. And it makes us feel like something's wrong. And so do your best to really be con conscious of that and say, you know what? I'm so glad that they appear to be happy. Not 100% sure they are happy, but I'm, I'm glad for them and I'm happy for them. And you know what, though, I'm also happy for where I'm at and for the relationship I have. And it may be different than theirs, but it's my relationship and it's a great relationship. So that's just one example. There's other examples, obviously, of looking at people's education or looking at people's careers, looking at their status in their, in this, uh, in their society or their, their friend groups. And you look at those things, you're like, man, I wish I could be them, but I can promise you it's not always as good as it looks from the out, as, far, as nice as it does the outside is when you actually get into it. So, but the problem is that when you start comparing yourself to others, you're also then judging yourself and that's going to make you feel inadequate. Like I said, so you really want to do a good job of not comparing yourself to others because that's also going to take self-judgment also away. So it'll be a habit that you'll get out of. The other one is an outcome obsession. A lot of people are focused on the end result and not understanding that it it's not going to happen. I think a lot of times we think that when I lose the 20 pounds, I'll be happy. When I get that job, I'll be happy. When I get to that point in my life and I make that, when I make that much money, I'll be happy. And it doesn't happen. I promise you it does not happen. No matter where you think that you're going to get, you're not going to be there. I remember when I did an interview with a young kid that came from one of the Northville school, he came to do an interview with me. He goes, when did you finally know that you've reached it? you've become successful? And I thought that's funny because he said, when you've gotten there. 
and the truth is, is that you never feel like that. You know, no matter, you know, I right now I have two businesses, 45 employees. It's more than I ever imagined, but I'm still not there. You know, there is no there. There is no getting there. It's always going to be a journey, a process. And that's what we really want to focus on is, is what does that journey look like? And, and, and how is it that I can be the best steward of this life and of, of my friends and my community? How can I be the best for them? And that's what we're trying to do today by being here is hopefully we're helping you guys find the best way to be yourself. So understand, focus on that journey. All right. Another one. Do you ever feel like cleaning? No. And you know, so oftentimes, especially when we're anxious or we're depressed or we're not feeling well, that we don't want to do things that we know that would help us feel better. And what we find is that our feelings are going to follow our behaviors. Like you never feel like cleaning the kitchen, but once you've cleaned the kitchen, you feel better. It's the same thing with, with, with some of the th activities we're going to talk about. You may not want to do it, but once you do it, you're going to feel better afterwards. And so you don't have to feel like exercising. Just do it. And once you do it, then you're going to start creating a behavior and a habit. So we want to create those behaviors and the feelings will follow. As you start becoming more active, then you're going to want to, then you'll start feeling like becoming more active. It's the same thing uh, when you start eating good. You know, at first, who wants to eat good? But once you start eating good, you start feeling better. And then you realize, man, this feeling better is great. So now you want to have the behavior of eating better more often. So many times, just do it. Nike had it perfect. Just do what it is that you should be doing, regardless of how you feel, because the feelings will follow the behavior. These are some of our emotional strength training habits. You know, um, I've done all of these. I love them all. Um, I have to be honest, meditation is probably my least favorite. I did it for six months, though, an hour a day, six days a week. And I have to be honest with you, I don't do it a lot anymore, but I do believe I, I grew from that experience. Um, for me to sit down in a quiet room in an environment twice a day, 30 minutes, it was, it was crazy. My brain was a chatterbox. But what was great about it is I learned that there was so much noise that's being created by my brain. You know, they say you have 76,000, 76,000 thoughts a day, conversations a day. And those conversations are with yourself. You know, do that, do this, do this. What is that? What do you think that's going to, what is this? And so you're doing all these things. And what's great about meditation allows you to see and witness that conversation. And it was really fantastic because it helped me understand that there is a lot of chatter. And it also taught me though, how to kind of stop the noise because it's that noise, it's that constant chatter that drives us crazy in many cases. And we get hyper vigilant, we get hyperactive, the more stressed we become. And so meditation is really cool for that, but you can't use it as a fire extinguisher. A lot of times people try to do some of these behaviors like journaling, yoga, affirmation. They're doing it to get out of the fire. So they, they, they're under stress, they're all these things. And they're like, okay, now I'm gonna start meditating. It doesn't work that way. It's best to start meditating when you feel good, when you have a good life going. It's better to start these yoga behaviors. It's better to visualize them, do affirmations before you feel bad. Because like I said earlier, these are the things that are going to strengthen your brain, that are going to make you more resilient. But you have to do them for a long period of time to get the benefit. You don't go to the gym and work out once and have a nice looking body. It takes time. And that's with all of these things. And this is what's so important for all of you to understand is that it's not one of these things. It's going to be a little of all of these things, but on a regular basis, you'll start to notice a change and a growth of your brain. So it becomes resilient. And this is one of the reasons I believe that I've gotten better with managing stress. And I can tell you the people that know that knew me 15 years ago or 10 years ago to now have said, and they've seen it, you're a different person now than you were then. And that's the whole point of all of this is, is the emotional growth. And it's unfortunate we weren't taught this as we're children that we can get and, and strengthen our brains to become healthier. And these are some of the conversations I try to have with my children. They don't want to have it, but I'm trying to tell them, you know, we've got to start working on some of your self-talk right now because the self-talk that you're feeding yourself is harming you. And, and I know that you're better than this. And I know that you can overcome this. And so let's think about how we could reposition the way that we're talking to ourselves. And so journaling has been big. Yoga is very, very helpful. I mean, there's a whole community of people that will swear by yoga and tell you it's changed their life because it's helped reduce some of that stress. 
try mantras, you know, Google the word mantra and then think about some mantras, but, you know, try the, the mantra of I'm amazing. Uh, you know, every day I, I start the day, I, not every day, but I like to start my day with the first thing. And when I wake up is today is an amazing day. I don't say it's going to be an amazing day. It is an amazing day. And at the end of the day, before I go to bed, you know, that's why I think prayer and some of these things are so great. It's because it allows people to reflect and allows them to say, you know what? Thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for everything that you've given me. Thank you for all the wonderful things in my life and all the wonderful people in my life. And thank you for that struggle. Thank you for that challenge. Thank you for that obstacle. Thank you for that pain in my ass, that one person, you know, thank those things and thank those people. So you start and end your day. But one of the most powerful things I've really started to come into is now the visualization. The visualization for me has been life-changing for me. And for me, it, it really is, it's different because you know, I, I like to think of a lot of these things in our lives as emotional traumas. They've trained us, right? Like I was talking about earlier. And, and for me, and then now looking back, when did I first start experiencing high levels of stress is when I graduated school and started caring for patients. And what happens is, and one thing you'll learn about me is that I'm extremely highly focused when I meet with a patient. I am all in. I'm focusing 100% of my energy and my resources to that patient. And in many cases, it takes a high level of energy to do that. I've also, though, had, unfortunately, some really, really bad experiences with patients that have come in that have just basically just been extremely mean and rude and just unhealthy. And because of those traumas, it's, it's, it started affecting me. Because of the traumas of an employee calling and quitting, because of an employee stealing, because of a, of a person lying, uh, because of these traumas at work, I started to associate work as a fire. I started to think I was going to burn my hand when I went to work. So every Friday, I felt great. Every Sunday night, I started having anxiety. And it was the same pattern all the time. And I realized that I'd started to view, after doing some of this work, is that I started to realize that I had started, I had created an environment where I thought work was going to harm me. It was going to hurt me. And I, I realized that I had to start changing the way I thought about work and about what happens at work. Yes, sometimes you, when you put your hand in the fire, it hurts, but sometimes you use the fire and it's great. It's wonderful. It keeps you warm. It keeps everything lit. It keeps the bugs away. It feeds you. It's the same thing with work. There's so many wonderful things that have happened over my life that I realized that my brain, and it's simple because your brain is like, they say it's the reptilian brain, it's the lizard brain, that part of your brain that's reactionary is it's just seeing threat, 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 threat. But understand that you can reprogram your brain and your, your thoughts and your then lead to emotions lead to biological changes. So I'm biologically getting fight or flight because of work, thinking about work, not ever being at work. And so I had to start changing the way I started viewing and interpreting what was gonna happen. And for me now, it's like, I think at work, I think about having, I think about that one patient encounter I had, it was the most amazing experience where we really connected and I really found that there was a way that we could help them. And then we saw them and we saw their lives change. Or that employee that said, you know what, I really want to thank you for being a great leader and a great provider and, and, and a good inspiration for us. And, you know, I just want to start really focusing and visualizing the things that have made me feel so good through my career instead of the things that make you feel so bad. All right. Whew, you can tell me a little emotional, but I hope this is helping. The next step is get it outside, you know, walk barefoot on the grass, you know, take your shoes off, reconnect with mother nature. You know, one of the things to, to being, I think, successful in the mental aspects of your health is to reconnect spiritually. Um, you know, either you believe in God, Buddha, I don't care. It doesn't matter. But if you believe in a higher power, you know, you want to connect to that. You want to feel like you're a part of a bigger community. And that's what science has shown us that people that feel that they're a part of a bigger community that have a spiritual sense of them are generally healthier. Um, if you're, if you, if you don't believe in that and you believe in creationism or uh, um, Darwinism, you know, that's fine too. But understand that that's nature. So get in nature more often and connect with, with, with mother nature more often. So get outside and, and be connected with mother earth and walk barefoot in the grass. It's a great thing to just take off your shoes and, and, and play in the environment that we were created to be in. 
soak in the sun's warming rays, get outside, especially and even if there's not much sun out, just being outside helps guys. Guys, I, I go out all the time and I'll hit golf balls for 30 minutes and I'll go out in the 40 degree weather, 30 degree weather. I'll put some warm clothes on, but just being outside, breathing fresh air and getting out and doing something physical, being active is so important. And you do get some benefit from being out there in the sun breathe in the fresh air and take a walk in nature. You know, these are all great things that are going to slow things down and help you be more present. And that's a big part of, of slowing down the stress response that we get. Um, decrease the amount of stimuli you expose yourself to have a digital sunset. You know, they, these, these, these phones, these kit, these things have thousands of pixels. And what they're saying is, these pixels are a lot for our nervous system to adapt to, and it's just a lot to take in. And so we want to reduce our exposure to the digital stimuli. Uh, we want to slow things down when we start to feel overwhelmed or overstressed. And so if you start to feel yourself getting ramped up or getting worked up, the last thing you want to do is get on Facebook and just start and, and get on and start looking at other people. You, and you want to start finding a way to turn things off and slow things down not overstimulating and searching things and Googling things and getting overstimulated. You just need to turn things off. And so turn off, um, turn off the, the, the lights in the house, get some candles, get some scents going, some smells going that, 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 that make you feel calm. What was it lavender? Um, some of you guys use essential oils, do those things, create a good environment where things can slow down and calm down. So when you get home, it's not just numbing your brain because that's, that's not really teaching you to relax. So think, think about that. Um, kick the habit guys. I know that we use alcohol, we use illegal, legal drugs, but the problem is that there's ups and downs and yeah, I'll have a cocktail, but I find if I have three cocktails, forget it. I'm going to have a bad day the next day. It's not a hangover but I'm going to have an emotional low day. And so it's kind of learning about where's that limit for you in some cases and some people you have to completely eliminate it because there's, it's going to enhance the ups and downs. And they found that when people smoke, for example, the, the chemicals stimulate and then it goes ups and downs. And so there's this always ups and downs. And so we want to slow things down. We want to eliminate sugar uh, because that's going to create more of that up and down. Like we talked about the blood sugar earlier. And so these are all important things to, to, to look at and evaluate and ask yourself, you know, is this hurting me or harming me or, or helping me? Mood boosting activities. Um, you know, I, I listen to a lot of books now. I find that it's very good. If I do happen to wake up in the middle of the night, I do find that turning a good book on and listening to a book because um, that way I don't have to turn the lights on. It's been great, especially when it's a really boring book. It puts me right back to sleep. Uh, but also just listening to other people's struggles, how they've triumphed, all these things are good. And I'll show you some research in a second, but it shows that reading actually is beneficial for depression and anxiety. Uh, you know, look for how you're going to reprogram your brain. So look for podcasts that are, are, are things that inspire you, like Lewis Hose's um, The School of Greatness. Andy Stanley is a preacher out of Georgia, but he's got some great podcasts on just mood and attitude. Uh, look around on YouTube, look around for those things that are going to give you things are going to build your brain up and make it stronger. The fact of listening to that song, Weightless. So guys, go to YouTube right now, type in um, Macaroni Union Weightless. And it's been shown that this reduces anxiety by 65% in participants and a 35% reduction in their usual physiological resting rate. So they're seeing that people's biology is improving by listening to this one um, audio track. Also, let's see next. Reading uh, right here, it says out of the out of the University of Sussex that, that by reading just six minutes a day can reduce your stress levels by up to 68%. Physical stress, guys, if you're having any physical pain, it can definitely deplete your body because of pain releases more cortisol. Cortisol is going to lower your dopamine levels and lower your serotonin levels. So what we want to do is we want to reduce our pain to get those levels up. So you need to find out what's causing the physical pain. If you have a rock in your shoe, it's going to cause a pain in your foot. Simply taking an Advil or ibuprofen is not going to get rid of the rock in your shoe. A lot of times when we have pain, it can be because we have a spinal misalignment. So we need to go to a chiropractor. It can be because we have tight muscles. We have poor posture. So we need to work on our bodies physically the best that we can to improve it so it doesn't have pain so that we 
that's another stressor like we talked about that's going to put you over the tipping point so you want to eliminate and improve as much as you can so that's also what we're seeing too with the exercise it's extremely important exercise reduces our stress and increases our ability to resist stress you know I, this is something that i think is one of my secret powers or secret tips to tools is exercise you know i go to the gym in the mornings I can't tell you how much better my day is when I do that. It makes me more resilient. It makes me stronger. And that's what research is showing is, is that when you exercise, it makes you more resilient to stress. It helps you manage stress so much better. So it's so important to get out and be active and do something with your body, especially if you have anxiety and depression. Uh, biological stressors. These are the things that we can eat that can cause stress to us. The real whole foods, we want to eat as healthy and whole foods as possible. We don't want to eat man-made foods because those are chemicals and those chemicals our bodies don't know and it causes stress to our bodies to ingest things that aren't made from Mother Earth. If we have too much sugar, we already talked about this, it's going to cause a uh, situation. So you want to make sure that you have a low glycemic food. Uh, you don't want to eat a Snickers bar. I mean, you don't want to eat uh, bread, pasta, Snickers, sugars, because you're going to have these ups and downs. It's going to cause more stress. And you want to make sure you're drinking hydrated water, clean, filtered water. This is some research out of BMC psych Psychiatry. They found that the daily intake of less than five servings of fruits and vegetables was associated with higher odds of depression. <laughs> So there's your prescription right there, guys. Eat your fruits and vegetables. It's been shown to benefit your mood. And this was a study that was done on 73,000 people from uh, India. And it was quite, a, quite an extensive study, but yeah, they found that five servings of fruits and vegetables. Proper sleep is critical, guys. Like we mentioned earlier, you guys know it. You've seen it. When kids don't get enough sleep, they're irritable, they're crabby, they're moody, and they're, 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 they're terrible. And a lot of times when I talk to people that are stressed or depressed, I'm like, well, how much are you sleeping? It's like, well, it's no wonder you've feel so bad, you know? You're going to feel bad if you're not allowing yourself to get enough sleep. So this isn't the situation where you're waking up and you can't go back to sleep or you can't fall asleep. This is a situation where you can, but you just choose not to. You stay up too late and um, you don't get to bed on time. So set your alarm to go to bed. You know, tell yourself, I've got to get in bed by 9.30 because I'll be asleep by 10. Don't go to bed at 11.30, get to bed at 12 and get, think that five hours, six hours is going to cut it. It's just not enough. You need to try to aim for seven hours. Guys, yeah, this is where the work comes in. Like we said before, it's something that you have to do consistently to see change. Uh, if you're consistent, you don't practice, you won't experience the benefits that you want. Uh, if you show up and put in the effort consistently, you will see changes in your attitude and your energy. So pick some things that you think you can commit to over the next few days. We'll get to that in a second. I'm sorry, I think I get ahead of slides. But this is how health works. You go down, you're declining, declining. And over time, you're going to go up. It's going to be ups and downs. It's never a straight linear line. And a lot of times we get discouraged when it's not, when we're, we're like, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, but I'm not feeling better. It's because you might be doing it because you're hoping it makes you feel better. And then when you don't feel better, you quit and discontinue it. Like we said earlier, you're, you're using some of these lifestyle things as fire extinguishers. Sometimes it's important to get out of the fire first off, but once you're out of the fire, realize that you need to work on it and keep working on it. So the next time you're back into a fire situation, it's not going to bring you back down here again. But if you already start out here and then you get put in a stressful situation, it can bring you down to where now you get stuck in that rut again. So you want to build your way up. And then when you hit that stressor again, you won't go back all the way down to here again. So that's the key is you want to keep working on this. You want to keep building on it, even when you feel good. Choose three things now that you're going to commit to over the next 60 days. Um, these are some ideas. You want to strength train your brain. You want to do the meditation, journal, affirmation, the visualization, yoga. You want to change your focus to loving others. You want to practice gratitude and appreciation. You maybe want to turn it off and reduce the TV and the internet. You want to create a positive environment. You know, think about your room. Think about your 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 actual environment. Like, what can I do to make this environment where when I come into it, I feel good about it? So maybe it's cleaning it up. Maybe it's putting some candles out. Maybe it's creating a new pic picture, putting some artwork up. But make it an environment that you want to be in. Um, eliminate your tolerations, your incongruencies. Guys, we all know that we have some things that we're tolerating right now in our lives. We may be drinking too much. We may be shopping too much. We may be relying on too much TV, too much social media that are, that are things that we have created as mechanisms to cope with our lives and think about those things and say, what can I get rid of these tolerations or these incongruencies in my life that will make me feel better? And I know that this is hurting me 
and try to eliminate that because the more incongruencies we have, the more pain we're going to have. You want to exercise 20 minutes a day. You want to eat healthy. You want to get more sleep and better sleep and get help from a professional coach, mentor, or an incredible doctor's office. You know, these are all things that you can put on your list of things that you can do. Think about them, find three of them and commit to them. All right, next. The biological stressors. Um, the three things that we find in our office, I'm going to try to run through this as quickly as possible. I know this has been long. The three hidden stressors are poor gut function, inflammation, and hidden infections. These are three things that we see all the time that are inside of the body. They're causing damage, causing stress that are putting onto that scale and are tipping us over that breaking point. So you can try to do this. You can eat better. You can eat, be healthy. You can meditate. But sometimes there's a biological stressor that's holding the scale down that's not allowing it to come back up. And let me show you what some of those are real quickly. The gut brain axis, how the microbiome in our gut affects anxiety and depression. We know that the, the floor in our gut, guys, there's more nerves and nerve cells in our gut than in our entire body. And you guys have heard it. I, I just felt it in my gut or I'm sick to my stomach. And what we're finding now is that the microbiome, our microbiome, the majority of the microbiome is found in our gut. But guys, there's more cells in our body of the microbiome of this world than our own tissues of our own cells. So the health of this microbiome, the health of the bacteria that's in your gut is critical. I, can, I didn't put the slide in here today, but there's studies, guys, that they put rats, they feed them probiotics, and they find that these rats are able to handle more emotional stress. Don't, don't ask me how they do that, but they do have testing to determine this rat or this mouse is more resilient to stress with the right bacteria than if they have the wrong bacteria, if they have this dysbiosis, this overgrowth in the gut. 90% of your body's serotonin is produced in the gut. If you have a poor diet, you have poor gut function, you have low serotonin, depression, and anxiety. Because so often too, serotonin actually helps with the contraction of your bowels to help you go to the bathroom. So one of the first signs we see of people that are depressed is they're constipated. And unfortunately though, on some of the side effects of the medications they're taking is also constipation because it messes with that serotonin balance. Decrease serotonin, increase equals depression and anxiety. All right, there, there was a disruption I was gonna tell you about. There's the dog barking. I knew it was gonna happen right about now. That's all right. So neuroendocrinology letter, they found that the gut brain barrier in major depression. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the term leaky gut, but they're saying what's happening is some of the bacteria is leaking out of the gut into our blood, getting to our brains. And it's triggering inflammation of the brain and it can be a trigger an inflammatory pathophysiology of depression. So it's so important with all of our patients, especially patients who are complaining of unexplained depression or anxiety. We look at their gut to see what's happening there. And so we do a five page stool test to really analyze what's happening there. Vitamin D, for example, uh, depression in adults, I can't tell you, but I would say 99.9% .9 of the people that come to our clinic are vitamin D deficient. And they've known it for years, but it's so important to understand that vitamin D is critical for your, for the, your neurohormonal system because it's a, in itself, vitamin D is a neurohormone. So vitamin D is gonna be critical to our immune system and our neuronal system, our nervous system health. And that's what they said in the study here is that basically it was a great for uh, the prevention the treatment of vitamin D is something to consider. Now don't run out and take just vitamin D unless you need it and make sure that if you are taking it, it's the right kind and it actually gets your levels up. So you need to retest. Uh, already went over this side. So this is from the journal of clinical endocrinology and metabolism. They found that we conclude that women with elevated TPO antibody levels, this is a autoimmune disease of the thyroid. And so I know some of our patients are still watching this. If you have an autoimmune disease of your thyroid, that means your immune system's attacking your thyroid. So once again, it's that immune system, the microbiome, the bacteria, our, our immune systems. When that happens, when our bodies are always attacking our thyroid, for example, they're more prone and at risk for depression. And two of the most depressed patients I've ever seen had antibody markers that were off the chart. They couldn't be measured any higher because they hit the high line and went beyond it. So this is absolutely something that can trigger that. And so many people, have a thyroid condition, they take thyroid medication and they're not even aware they have an autoimmune disease. And so they don't ever put the two and two together, but they're like, you know, what's funny is after my second child, I started having depression. And a lot of times what happens with the changes in our hormones, when you have children and the trauma actually of having birth, it can actually trigger the autoimmune condition to kick in, trigger that leaky gut and trigger that immune system cascade. And now they start having thyroid issues. So now they take thyroid medications, but now they have this depression that's lingering and they don't know why. And a part of that can be because their immune systems 
are over inflamed in that leaky gut process, those, those toxins are getting the brain infecting it, leading to depression. The second hidden stressor is inflammation. Can a simple blood test solve depression? One of the tests that we do in our office is homocysteine. Homocysteine is a marker and they found that when homocysteine levels are low, I mean, when they are high, that means that they're missing certain new serotonin. And homocysteine can be an inflammation marker that's specific to the arteries. So the more inflamed the arteries are, the less blood flow we're gonna to get to our brain, the less nutrients we get to our brain, the less positive and less, the less, I may hate to say this word, but the less good we feel. <laughs> Um, elevated CRP, this is another inflammation marker that we test. Uh, it's a very simple test. It's a blood work test. It can be done with LabCorp or Quest. But elevated CRP has been linked to depression. They, this is the 73,000 in Denmark. Uh, they found that the highest levels of CRP were more than twice as likely to have psychological distress and depression than those with normal levels of CRP. I told you I was going to hurry up and finish this, but I will dive into this a little bit. CRP is released from your liver and its job is to go out and sweep up dead and damaged cells. So it only makes sense that you guys have all heard it's you know, the mind-body connection. Well, we know that your mind can affect your body physically. And we know now that your body can affect your mind. And all this test is telling us is when we see high levels of inflammation is that the body is being damaged on the cellular level. And how are you supposed to feel good if your body's being damaged? It's going to wear on you and it can wear on you emotionally too. That's what they're finding. Hidden infections, guys, um, as another culprit. And what we're finding is that, for example, yeast is linked to mental illness. Uh, this was done in John Hopkins Medicine. They found that candida, which is a yeast overgrowth, and candida is usually fed and bred by sugars. And typically when people have a candida or yeast overgrowth, they can have whiteness on their tongue, they can have severe brain fog or fatigue, they can have gas or bloating in their stomach, and they can crave sugars. And these patients, uh, they found is that there was more likely to be schizophrenia or bipolar disorder when they had candida than if they did not have candida. So this is so important. Like we said before, it's just another one of those things that trick it, it, that eat away at the body and put the scale over the limits. So the next one is how do you know if you have hidden infections? Well, that's where you work with a doctor like ourselves, where you do the right testing to find out what can I do to eliminate as many biological stresses as I have so that my body can start to become healthier and healthier and I can start to feel better. Because once again, guys, I don't have all the answers for depression or anxiety, we don't. But we have some really good answers and some really good tools. And I don't have the testimonials in here, but go to our website, look at the testimonials tab. You're gonna see people that are gonna tell you their stories about how they overcame depression and anxiety with a multifactorial approach. They did their job, we helped them do what they needed to do. And when we put all those pieces together, they got better. So if you'd like to schedule a consultation, meet with one of us, let us know. Um, I put a link already in, in the, um, somewhere up, up, up or down or below or sideways, but click that link and schedule with us and come in and have a consultation. Those consultations are absolutely uh, free of charge and they're no obligation, guys. We're not looking for anything from you. We're just looking to see how does that we can help you. And if we do think we can help you, we'll outline what your testing would look like, what your care would look like. And so you have a good idea of what it's going to take for us to help you. So I hope that's helpful, guys. Have a good one. Uh, have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. I think I stopped it.